Thank you to turn in your Bibles this evening to the book of Genesis chapter number 3. The book of Genesis chapter number 3 and we want to uh, begin to look in this section of scripture. It's not going to be, uh, we will not cover all of it today, but um, one of the fears I think sometimes I have with uh, teaching familiar passages is the amount of familiarity that it oftentimes has. And I think sometimes that can actually become a, uh, a great detriment to us. Uh, it's like we've already heard it. We know the story. We know how it ends and so forth. And, and sometimes we read our own Bibles that way. And I think sometimes we listen to messages sometimes that way. My study of Genesis 3, I think I, it's probably fair to say that I've come away with more questions than I have answers. And uh, I guess it's encouraging to find that there are other individuals who battle the same questions and uh, do not come to the same answers as well. There are those who are <clears throat> extremely dogmatic in their opinions, and I don't think that that is uh, at all wise approach when the scripture is... Uh, dogmatic. I have no problem being dogmatic, but when the scripture is not dogmatic and it's silent or uh, there are multiple ideas that are possible, I think we start running into uh, some issues with that. When it comes to the aspect of creation and, and the time prior to the fall, the reality is you and I have a very little comprehension of what that time would actually have been like. Uh, we do not know how long it lasted. We know that for at least six days at the end of that sixth day, God saw everything that he had made and said it was very good. How long did it go after that? We do not know. Uh, how beautiful was the Garden of Eden? I think we have absolutely no clue uh, how beautiful it was. And there are those who have attempted to try to find the Garden of Eden today. Let me tell you, it has been uh, significantly altered by a worldwide flood. Even if we could locate it exactly, we would be unable to determine what it was actually like. What was a world like in which sin did not exist? We don't know that. What were relationships like when sin did not exist? And again, we do not know that. There are lots of questions as we go through this particular section of Scripture. And many of these questions we can ask and they're simply not going to be answered. We know that after the flood, man's relationship with animals changed. It was at that point in time when Noah came off of the ark that God said, animals are going to be afraid of you. Uh, they are going to now be your meat and they're going to do everything they can to not be your meat. Uh, they're going to be fearful of you. That relationship changed. Well, it makes me wonder, what was the relationship like prior to that? Prior to the flood? I've always been puzzled why Eve talked to a serpent naturally. I have no idea. Uh, I've talked to animals. Uh, I don't talk to a snake, I can tell you that. Uh, he, he's going to be dead and they can say it's a black snake and they're good for you. Yeah, they're not good for me uh, whatsoever. When we'd find one in the gymnasium, I'd call up Mike Benton and say, Mike, you got 10 minutes to come get this thing. Otherwise, I'm going to take care of it. And uh, he was there without fail within 10 minutes. And uh, many black snakes left our gym uh, playing game of basketball uh, and traveled over to uh, Mike Benton's garden. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'll take them. Yeah, they're good for you. No, they're not good for me. They give me heart attacks. Okay. Uh, there's nothing good about that. Uh, but Eve talks to this serpent as though this was a normal occurrence. What was the relationship like uh, between these animals? And uh, we have no idea. Did the lion, was he originally called a tiger and told Adam I'd rather be called a lion? And Adam said, okay, fine, I'll call you a lion. I, <laughs> we don't know. What was all of this like? 
And there are a lot of mysteries to us. It's interesting that uh, nowhere in Genesis 3 do you actually find it stated that uh, Satan was occupying the serpent. Now we do know in uh, Revelation, a little bit later on in the book of Revelation, you find that uh, the reference is that serpent, that old serpent, the devil. So there is a reference that is made back to it. But if, if you were to just look at Genesis 3, you would not find that. Uh, there are a lot of intriguing things. We go back, though, however, and we're reminded as to why God put this section of Scripture in here. He did not provide this section of Scripture for us to be able to answer all of these puzzling questions. He did not describe the Garden of Eden to the extent that we would be able to vision it in our own minds. He certainly could have done so, but he chose not to do so. Genesis chapter number 3 is a portrait of how sin entered the world and its effects on it. And needless to say, regardless of what the relationship was like before sin, we see how it has affected things now. We want to begin our study tonight with a message that is entitled, Sin, a Deadly Deception. And that is going to occupy our focus for uh, chapter number three, though we'll only cover uh, the first seven verses here tonight. In Genesis 3, if you'll notice verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. As we begin to look at the nature of sin, there are four principles that I want to identify here tonight out of these first seven verses. The first principle is this, sin is cunning and deceptive. Of all of the beasts in the field, the Bible teaches in verse number one that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The word subtle would suggest that he is the most cunning of all of them. What the relationship was like prior to, again, is something that we are unable to know. The, the fact that the serpent began speaking to Eve, and that did not cause any kind of uh, alarm to me, is something that is very puzzling. But what we can say is this, things were not then what they are now. Its cunning nature, however, made this the perfect animal for Satan to possess. Satan's attacks, although this may seem rather obvious, are both cunning and deceptive. Sin is, does not have neon lights that are flashing saying danger ahead. That's not at all how it is portrayed. It is very deceptive in its nature. Uh, people will try to reason through things and say, well, well, I don't understand why so-and-so would do such and such a thing. There's a problem with that. Sin never makes sense. The nature of it is cunning. The nature of it is deceptive. If it were obvious that this is what's going to happen, then we would find very quickly that we would do everything that we could to simply avoid it. Yet, many Christians are deceived by it. And the Bible teaches us in uh, the book of James that uh, Satan is a roaring lion. 
He walks about seeking whom he may devour. I said James, I believe it's 1 Peter. Uh, is a roaring lion. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Is it all that obvious? And the answer to that is no. Go throughout all of the temptations throughout the word of God. Pick any of them. And what you'll find is there is a sense in which it is cunning. And there is a sense in which it is deceptive. There is this idea that you are going to be able to get away from it. And you can go ahead and enjoy it. And you can take pleasure in all of it. Sin is cunning and deceptive. In order to avoid it, obviously, then Christians are going to have to exercise great discernment. In order to gain that kind of discernment, believers are going to have to spend time in the Word of God, constantly studying it and constantly sharpening their relationship with the Lord so that they are able to see these things and avoid them. Peter was confident that he would not deny the Lord, even confident that to the point that he would follow him all the way to the death. And Jesus assured him, Peter, within a few hours, in a very short time, you will have already denied me on three separate occasions. And that is exactly what happened. Peter never saw it coming, however. We could go on and on and on and cite many, many examples. Satan is very cunning and Satan is very deceptive. I also want you to see, secondly, that sin always focuses on the forbidden and ignores the provision. Notice the question that he asks in verse number one. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The question by its very nature begins to direct Eve's attention to the one restriction that God has placed upon them. And by focusing his attention on this one restriction, immediately the seeds of both doubt and fairness are placed in Eve's mind. Temptation by its nature always centers on that which is forbidden. It always looks for that which God says no towards. It's interesting that when we begin to compare things and when we begin to reason along these lines as Satan successfully got Eve to doing, we will oftentimes find ourselves looking at certain things and thinking, you know, God, that's just not fair. Everyone else gets to do it. Everyone else gets to have this. Everyone else gets to do all of these things. And here I am, God, serving you and look at everything that I'm having to go through. God, that's not fair. It's the restriction that is placed. Eve's response is a rather interesting response. She says in verse 2, the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She explains to the serpent that we are able, we have been given the permission to be able to eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden of Eden. God gave them literally Everything that they needed. You're in Genesis 3. Look back quickly at chapter 2 and verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. I've given you all of these things, says the Lord. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I've given you all of this, just simply don't do this. And that was exactly where Satan began to key her focus on. The one restriction. Now, Eve properly explained the restriction. She said in verse 2, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. We have been given permission to be able to eat from all of these various fruits. And we don't even know what kind of fruits they were. But we are able to eat of them. But of the tree of the knowledge of 
or but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that fruit that is placed right there in the middle of the garden, God said we shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now this is one of those verses where people get very dogmatic. They'll look back in Genesis 2 and find that God never once said that they can't touch it. Then they go all the way up to the book of Revelation and say, if you are adding to God's word, you are wrong. Well, let me point out to you, that's not necessarily a very smart statement to make. Number one, we do not know that God did not also include, perhaps on a separate occasion, not to touch it. But let me add to this, it sure is an awfully good safeguard to not touch it. Because you can't eat it if you don't touch it. You would have to touch it in some way. Some of you are thinking, yeah, well, I wouldn't have to reach up and grab it. You still have to touch it with your lips, your teeth, okay? If you don't touch it, you can't eat it. And so I don't think that there's necessarily, and I don't think that Eve is adding to the word of God as, the, uh, as John speaks of in the end of the book of Revelation. These two things are not parallel. But yet here was the restriction that was here. He should not eat of it, neither shall he touch it. And here's the reality of it, lest he die. There's... Nothing wrong with Eve's response. She both clearly and accurately explained the consequences of disobedience. And that is death. All throughout the word of God, we find that the consequence of sin is death. God did not intend for death. Death came as a result of sin. Twice in Ezekiel chapter 18, the statement is made, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We're familiar with Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oftentimes as believers, we do not see sin as God does. In doing so, we often find ourselves minimizing the consequences of it. We'll rationalize things away and say stuff like, well, it's really not that big of a deal. I can do whatever I want to do. Or it's not hurting anybody. I don't see what's wrong with it. These are all fallacies that people for hundreds of years have adopted. These are all things that they've said, well, you know what? These are, are statements that are, to be honest with you, simply put, untrue. Sin has some very disastrous consequences, and the consequences of it are inevitable. And so Satan keys in and says, well, has, has God really said that, that you can't eat of every tree of the garden? Well, the response is, well, uh, we're not to eat of it nor are we to touch it lest we die. I mean, we've been given all of these things, but all of a sudden, the mind starts focusing on the one thing that I'm not supposed to have. It's similar, I suppose, to someone saying, here is a line, don't step across that line. Until that statement is made, nobody wants to step across the line. But once that statement is made, Suddenly there is a line that everybody's attention is attracted to. And the foot is inevitably going to get closer and closer and closer. Some will just barge right through it just to see what's going to actually happen. Others will get close to it and tiptoe across to see what's actually going to happen. If we were to say, do not step across this line, if you do so, there is a minefield just on the opposite side of that line. That's a good enough incentive for me to not test the line. We understand the consequences of it. Eve was very aware of the consequences of the sin. But Satan began to cause her mind to focus on what God had said no to. And meanwhile, ignored everything else that God had provided for them. The Bible teaches us that 
Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price of sin, for sin rather, on the cross. He did so so that his people might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is the element that God desires for all of his children to enjoy, but I would suggest that it's a, an element that very few Christians truly experience. We oftentimes have lives that are full of misery and heartache. We look at the world and how unfair it seems to be. We get the mindset that David developed in Psalm 73 where all of the ungodly individuals are prospering. And here I am serving you faithfully and, and Lord everything is hard and everything is miserable and I'm poor and all of these things yet the uh, wealthy or the, the wicked individuals have no problems. They've got everything made for them. What's happened is we've begun to take our minds and centered on the wrong thing. God does not desire for you to uh, in some way be shortchanged. In fact, God's plan is exactly what is necessary for us to be able to enjoy the fullness of life that God intends for us to enjoy. But tragically, there are very few Christians who are actually enjoying that life to that degree. Leads us to the third principle, and that is this. Sin is a direct defiance of God and his commands. He's now questioned the, what God has said and has begun to sow the seeds of doubt and fairness in Eve's mind. And suddenly he simply contradicts exactly what God has said. The serpent said, ye shall not surely die. That's not at all what God said. In fact, God said just the opposite. Back in Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 17, the Bible says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Satan used almost those exact words and said, Ye shall not surely die. The consequences that God said are not going to happen to you. You know, for whatever reason, we oftentimes view ourselves as the exception to what God has said. We can read passages such as Galatians chapter number 6 that teach us whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But for whatever reason, we conclude, well, that's not true for me. It is as far as if I sow good things, then I'll reap good things. But, but I mean, everybody has problems, and God knows that. And so you know, I think God's going to be very merciful. It's a misunderstanding of the nature of sin. God says that the way of the transgressor is hard. Yet there are many people who insist that the way of the sin and the way of the world is the life to live. It's the fun life. It's, it's the one that's going to give you everything that you want. Many young people have been swallowed up by the lures of this kind of world that so seems to offer and promise so much, but its delivery system is quite pathetic. It fails to deliver everything that it has promised. And there have been many adults who look back over a life that has been wasted in a life of sin and say, you know what, that was a very hard life. Some of you were saved later on in your life and you will attest to that very reality in your own personal life. Sin was not a pleasant life. There wasn't anything fun about it whatsoever. When it all comes down to it, the world, the flesh, and the devil say this about sin. God's word says this about sin. The question then comes, which one is it that we are truly going to end up taking? Which answer are we going to go ahead and choose? Are we going to say, well, you know what? Whatever God has said, that's how I'm going to live. Or are we going to say, well, you know, yeah, I know God said this, but I'm getting away with it, and all of this seems to be working out just fine for me. In the long run, you're not going to get away with it. And in the long run, sin is never going to produce the satisfaction that you think that it's going to produce. 
And then we find in verses 5 through 7 that sin offers improvement, but only produces destruction. God doth know, Satan real, uh, rationalizes, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. In the day that ye eat thereof. This is why God said that this is going to happen. God didn't say this is going to happen because that is actually what's going to happen. Instead, God said this is what's going to happen just simply because God actually knows that the day that you eat this, that's the day that your life is going to improve. And that's the day that you will be as God's. Satan claims to know this rationalization behind God's plan, but I can assure you his rationalization was false. He said, well, the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened. In other words, you will possess a higher level of discernment. Eve, things are actually going to improve for you if you do this. Ye shall be as gods, the King James rightly translates that. There are other versions that say ye shall be as God. Uh, it's plural in the Hebrew, it's gods. You will be as gods, you'll be as deities. You'll have the capacity to be able to know both good and evil. Never once did it dawn on Eve, we've never experienced evil. You and I can look at that and say, my goodness, Eve, what were you thinking? Look at all of the evil. She didn't even know what evil was. To her, evil might be something completely better than good. You'll be able to, everything is going to get better. Oh, how Satan still offers that same temptation. Just go ahead and lie on your income taxes, you'll have more money. After all, you can tithe more. You can be dishonest at work, it's okay, nobody cares, everyone does this anyway. What difference does it make if you go ahead and adjust your, your time frame just a little bit? It's okay. Look at the much, how much more money you'll be able to get. After all, you deserve it, you work harder than anybody else. And if you'll go ahead and do this, things are just going to be better for you. Go ahead and try this or uh, do this or drink this and, and, and things are going to be better for you. You'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. And Satan today has successfully deceived many people into somehow thinking that sin is actually going to offer improvement. Well, with this information and this higher level of discernment that she would be able to get, Eve began looking at this tree. I do not know how much time elapsed between verses 5 and 6. Again, I find a lot of questions. How long did she stare at this fruit? And incidentally, it probably was not an apple. How long did she stare at this fruit? How did she know that it was good for food? Did she watch an animal eat it? I don't know. Did the serpent take a bite of it? I have no idea. But she began to consider things. Notice we'll read verse 6 and then we'll look to another passage. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Hold your finger here in Genesis chapter number 3 and turn over to 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2, and it is here that we are given commands as believers of action that is to stop. Verse number 15 of 1 John chapter number 2 reminds us, Love not 
the world, neither the things that are in the world. The implication here in this passage is stop loving the world. It is a system that is completely opposed to God. Everything about the world is opposed to God. 1 John 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Notice verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. When Eve began looking at this tree and began rationalizing through things and, and reasoning through things with what Satan had said, the Bible says in Genesis 3 that she saw that the tree was good for food. It would satisfy the lust of the flesh, the desire of the flesh. God gave us hunger. It's a natural desire. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself as a desire. This will satisfy that desire. She also observed this fruit, according to Genesis 2 and verse, or 3 and verse 6, and observed that it was pleasant to the sight. This would satisfy, in 1 John 2 and verse 16, the lust of the eyes. And it was one that was a tree to be desired to make one wise. It would be the pride of life. None of that, the Bible says in 1 John 2, is of the Father. All of it, however, is of the world. You should not be deceived by it. Back in Genesis number 3, or chapter 3, number, verse number 6, here is Eve who began to examine this tree. She saw something with favor that God condemned. She looked at it and everything that it would promise. And incidentally, I would say that it was a very beautiful tree. If you go back into, again, Genesis 2, if you look at verse number 9, you see where the Bible says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Guys, these weren't half-dead trees with kudzu all over them. This was a beautiful tree. Everything about it appeared to be very desirable. She observed that the tree was pleasant to eat. It was good for food. It would be something that would provide nourishment for her. You could reason quickly, well, this is what God expects, is it not? He's the one that created the desire for food. She observed that the tree was pleasant to the eyes. It was a delight to the eyes. Let's use a different word. It was very attractive. Uh, the Hebrew actually would suggest it was a feast for the eyes. It was something to behold. She observed that the tree was desirable to make one wise or to make one insightful. She began looking very favorably upon everything that God had forbidden. And as she rationalized through this for a period of time that is unspecified, the Bible says in verse 6 that she eventually took the fruit thereof and did eat. She went ahead and ate it. God said no, but she went ahead and did it anyway. And then the Bible says, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Again, you need to be very careful about being dogmatic. When did Adam actually appear? We do not know. We do not know when, whether it was at the end of this, whether he had accompanied her the entire time. We don't know any of that. What we do know is that Adam, at some point in time, came with her. And he also ate. Why? Why? 
Did he do so so that she would not be alone and they would be able to do this together? Did she convince him that it had the same appeal that caused her to eat of it? We're not told the answers to these questions. And to be quite honest with you, the motivation behind Adam's disobedience is irrelevant because Adam disobeyed. And the results of his disobedience have put us exactly where we are today, according to Romans chapter number five. As by one man, sin entered into the world, and so death by sin, death passed upon all men for that all of sin, Romans chapter five, and I believe it's verse 22. First Timothy chapter number two and verse 14 tells us that Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam willfully disobeyed. Eve was deceived. Well, I want you to notice that it did not result in improvement as Satan had suggested, but what it did do is it produced destruction. Verse 7, the eyes of them both were opened. You know, that was what Satan said would happen. But they all of a sudden became aware of the consequences of their actions. Their eyes were open. The word would suggest their eyes were suddenly active and they began to realize things. The first thing that they realized was that they were naked. For the first time since man had been created, man experienced shame. Never before had they experienced it. This was a totally new feeling. To remedy the situation, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Man's natural tendency is to look at this and say, wow, you know what? We've got to fix this. Here's a problem. I need to remedy this. And there is no solution. This was the best that they were able to do. They took and stitched fig leaves together to make some sort of a loincloth. And that was as good as they could get done. Their Actions represent the best of man's actions today. There are those who attempt to cover this matter of sin their own way. God says it can only be covered one way, and that's through the death of Jesus Christ. There is no other way of covering it. But man's natural tendency is to remedy the sin problem themselves. And they were unsuccessful in doing so. When we examine this nature of sin, we all do very well to ponder that sin is cunning and deceptive. It has deceived many, many people. It has caused them into thinking things that they should not think. And this false rationalization is behind every sin. That if I do this, things will somehow be better. And that's not it at all. But many people have been deceived into thinking that. The natural focus of sin is always on what is forbidden. In doing so, man naturally forgets everything that God has provided. Don't do this, and that becomes the focus. The child growing up focuses on everything mom and dad won't let them do. Seldom do they appreciate the house that they have and the food that they've been given and the clothes they're able to wear. No, mom and dad gave me a curfew. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> mom and dad said, no, I can't play with my toys across the furniture. Hard lessons to learn, aren't they? Unfortunately, many adults have never learned them. 
We saw that sin is a direct defiance of God and his commands. That's how we have to evaluate it. We cannot just minimize it or seek to condone it in any way. Sin defies God. And though it offers improvement, it is incapable of producing it. Sin only produces destruction. So if you'd like a hard life, I would encourage you to live a life of sin. If you would like a life of regret and misery, do whatever it is that comes to mind and you'll experience it. But if you want a life of blessing and you want a life of true joy, I want to encourage you to live a life of obedience to God and his word because that is the only way that it is going to take place. Sin has such a lure to us, so appealing, seems to offer so much, but it's only capable of producing destruction. Let's steer clear to avoid it. As the songwriter said, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin.